cold out and not the way I didn't stop and get that line for Thanksgiving. But if you did that, I guess it's your choice. You had fun, but I thought, man, I'm glad I'm not doing that. I'm thankful. Anyways, I'd like to direct our attention this morning to Psalm chapter 1. Psalm 1. And for many of you, this will be a psalm you've studied before. My goal for you is to renew your sincere mind by way of reminder, as Peter said, to remind you of great truths of God's Word. This is a psalm that many have memorized, maybe memorized many times, and it's a psalm I continually go back to again and again. Every section of God's Word is precious to us, but this is a section I continually go back to again and again and again. Psalm 1 functions a little bit as an introduction to the psalms, and it's uh, what we categorize as a wisdom psalm. It lays out two groups of people. It lays out the righteous and the wicked, the blessed and the doomed. Those who know the Lord and delight in His Word and have God's blessing in this life, and those who are doomed in the life to come. So it really serves as a good introduction to the psalm, a good foundational section of Scripture. It is one psalm, and these were songs, as Bill talked about a couple weeks ago. So it does go together, it is one unit, but there are two main parts of this psalm. Like I said, the contrast between the righteous will be the first part, the blessed in verse 1 to 3, we'll see a description of the blessed person, and then in verse 4 to 6, we're going to see a, a description of the wicked man. And so it's a strong contrast that lays out two kinds of people in the world that in the end have two destinies. Look at verse 1. The psalm begins, How blessed is the man. And the word blessed basically means happy. How happy is the person. And the Hebrew word is asher. We get the English name Asher from this word. When Leah stopped bearing children, she gave her maid to Jacob, her husband, Zilpah. And Zilpah had a first child, and they named him Gad, fortunate. And then Zilpah conceived again, and Leah says this in Genesis chapter 30, verse 13. Then Leah said, Happy am I, for, I, for women will call me happy. So she named him. Happy, or Asher. The word means happy, blessed. And this is different than maybe we think of the happiness of the world that's based just on temporal and passing circumstances or based on the passing pleasure of sin. This would be a happiness that's more deep-rooted, a blessedness that comes from the favor of God in the life and knowing what God has done and will do in the future. I do want to say there is a happiness in the world of sorts. Hebrews 11 talks about the passing pleasure of sin. Sin does offer pleasure for a moment, but it's always deceiving. It never offers what it promises, and the happiness, the joy, the blessing never lasts. For the believer, though, there can be a blessedness. Go to Isaiah, if you would. Isaiah 48. I want to make this clear up front. Isaiah 48, the last verse of Isaiah 48. For the unbeliever, for the person that does not know God as their Savior, who does not know the grace and love of God that we just sang about, Isaiah 48, verse 22. There is no peace for the wicked, says the Lord. And turn over to chapter 57, the last verse of chapter 57 in Isaiah as well. The prophet, by inspiration of the Spirit, repeats it. Verse 20 of Isaiah 57, The wicked are like tossing sea. They cannot be quiet. The waters toss the refuse in mud. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. For the person who hasn't had their sins washed away in the blood of Christ, there is no peace. And peace... The word shalom, the Hebrew word shalom, is not just the absence of conflict. A little bit broader term, the Hebrew word is, that is wholeness, satisfaction, contentment, and internal peace. 
There is no peace. There might be a veneer. There might be a passing pleasure of sin, as the author of Hebrews says. But there is not true, deep-rooted happiness, joy, contentment that comes from a relationship with God. Go back to Psalm chapter 1. Now, this last summer on the 4th of July, I went out and bought about $20 of fire, fireworks for the kids. And uh, walking through the tent, there was one little firework I had to buy for 79 cents. It was called happiness. So I bought happiness this last summer, actually, just so you can see it. Somewhere up here. I blew it up. The happiness right here, 79 cents. An interesting thing was, on the 4th of July, I lit it off. It was like the worst one of the whole day. <laughs> Two seconds. <laughs> yeah. That was a good illustration of the pleasure that the unbeliever can have in this life. There is an enjoyment of God's common grace, and there is a passing pleasure in sin, but there's not peace. There's not true happiness in this life. The Psalm 1 starts out, it's going to give a description of the happy person. The blessed man. And I should note, the word blessed in verse 1, it's in the plural. A little bit hard to bring over in English, but <coughs> stressing the greatness of the blessing. Some have translated, oh the blessednesses. Oh the happinesses of. The idea is the greatness of the blessing, the happiness of the believer as we'll see. Now verse 1 through 3 give a description of the blessed man. In verse 1, it gives a description of what the blessed person does not do. And there are three things. We have a little outline up here. There are three things in verse 1. They're all connected. But there are three things a blessed person doesn't do. And in verse 2, there are two things he does do. And then verse 3 will be an illustration. Verse 1, a description of what the blessed person doesn't do. How blessed is a man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. Three things he doesn't do. And there's a progression through these three things. He doesn't walk. He doesn't stand. He doesn't sit. First off, he does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. And we're familiar with the imagery of walking. Not, it's not literally walking. It is conducting one's life. The blessed person doesn't conduct one's life based on the counsel of the wicked. The guidance, the advice, the philosophy, the direction of the wicked. And we think of wicked, sometimes we think of just those who are really, really bad. Who maybe should be incarcerated or something like that. The, the wicked man. But in the Bible it's used more broadly than that. It's used of anyone who doesn't fear the Lord. Who doesn't listen to His word. In Psalm 50, it's even used of those who go to the temple in Israel, who offer up sacrifices, but do not listen to the Word of God. So the wicked are not just those who society thinks are really bad. It's those who do not listen to God. Do not submit to Him. And it's a description of the blessed man in verse 1 through 3. But I do think in the description, it does carry an exhortation not directly commanding us what to do with the description. But in the description, there's an exhortation for believers to conduct their life in this way. So first, what he doesn't do is he does not walk in the counsel of the living. Basically, he doesn't listen to those who don't listen to God. Now, not when it comes to mechanics or dentistry or medical advice or what you choose to buy. When it comes to truth, when it comes to how to have sins forgiven, how to know the living God, how to live for Him, what's, cr what's true, what's wrong, what's right, what's in error. The happy person doesn't look to the world. Second thing in verse 1, he doesn't do, nor does he stand in the path of sinners. The idea of standing, you have walking, you have standing, the idea is probably to stop, to consider the way of sinners. Now, not just in an observational manner, but it is to stop to consider, to observe, and wanting to go along with them. Doesn't stand in the path of sinners. And sinners here, the idea behind the word is one who misses the mark. One who doesn't measure up to a standard. 
In Judges 20, verse 16, it's used of stone slingers who literally miss the mark. So it can be used in a physical sense of someone not hitting their target. But in an ethical and a moral or religious sense, it refers to one who doesn't measure up to God's standard. And Romans tells us, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The blessed man, the happy person, does not see those who don't measure up to God's standard and say, you know, I want to go that way. Their way of life, it might be better. Does not do that. In verse 1, the third thing he doesn't do, he does not sit in the seat of scoffers. Sitting has the idea of joining with. Not just observing from afar now, but coming up and joining with the scoffer. And the scoffer is the one who ridicules the Lord, what is holy, with his words. And it's not just the outright atheist who rails at God's word. It'd be anyone who ridicules what's holy and the truth of the word of God. For example, God says he made all things in six days. Ha! Huh. That's That'd be a scoffer. Jesus Christ is returning someday. Pie in the sky. That'd be a scoffer. God made man and woman equal yet distinct. Figment of man's imagination. That'd be a scoffer. The blessed person does not join in with those who scoff and mock the truth of the Word of God. You see the progression in verse 1? And sometimes that's the way it goes. So when first just listens to the counsel of the person who doesn't listen to the Word of God, then maybe says, you know what? Maybe that would be a good way to go. And then joins in. Sometimes that's the way progression goes. Verse 1 is saying, basically the ears are stuffed up to the ideas of the world, those who deny the Lord and do not submit to His truth. And this does not mean we're separatists. We remove ourselves from society. Go to 1 Corinthians, if you would, quickly. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. So I make this clear. This does not mean we remove ourselves from the world. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. <coughs> Excuse me. Sally, I already have water up here. So I start coughing. I'm okay. 1 Corinthians 5, 9. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I did not at all mean immoral people of this world, or covetous, or swindlers, and idolaters. For then you'd have to go out of the world. You see, we're not to remove ourselves from the world. We're not to move to some place remote. We're already in Nebraska, so I don't know where we go. And start a Christian commune where we only have believers around us. We don't isolate ourselves from the world. Go back to Psalm 1. But we are unique. We are to be holy. We are not to go the same way of the world. We're to march to a different drummer, so to speak. The world's going one direction with their counsel, with what they say, with what they do. Believers and the happy person, the blessed man, is going to go the opposite way, not listen to them. And that's what I want to talk more about in a little bit. They're not only opposite ways, going different directions, but they're going headlong into each other usually. Maybe you know Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2, very familiar verses to many of us. You know, very, Psalm 1 is very similar to that. You know, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's basically the same thing of verse 1. Don't listen to the world. Don't be squeezing it. The world's always pushing in. You know, we have not got to glory yet. We are not in the kingdom yet. We do live in a dark world. So there's constantly ideas. And they're not all as outright and obvious as all the other ones. But they're trying to squeeze us into its mold. The blessed person will close his ears to the world, not join with those who scoff and mock God. Verse 2 goes the other side. What he does do. And two things in verse 2 that the blessed person does do. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. So it's not just avoiding what the world says and thinking like the world and acting like the world, and that's it. Positively, verse 2, delighting in the truth of the Word and meditating on it. 
Delighting in the law of the Lord, verse 2. The law is the word Torah. It can refer to the Mosaic law given at Mount Sinai. It can refer to the first five books of the Bible. Or it can refer to just scripture in general. The word has the idea of instruction, of teaching. He delights in the law of the Lord. You know, all capitals, at least in my Bible, my Bible and probably yours as well. In verse 2, the law of the Lord. You know we're familiar with this, right? When you see all capitals, L-O-R-D, all capitals, the Hebrew word or name behind this is Yahweh. The believer delights in the law, the instruction, the word of Yahweh. You know, by the way, we just sang the first song this morning, Hallelujah, which is the Hebrew word for praise, hallel, to praise, and the shortened, for, shortened form of this name, Yahweh, Yah. That phrase means, praise be to Yah, praise be to Yahweh. But the blessed person delights in the word of God, the word of Yahweh. You know, Bible study is not just an obligation. It's not a, a mere duty. But it's a, it's a delight. We love the Lord, and we, so we love His word. You know, this book is His words. Not only words about Him, but His words. We delight in it. The happy person will delight in the Word of God. It doesn't mean we don't need discipline. I do believe the believer has warring desires, Galatians 5 and other passages. So it's not it's always going to be easy and every part of me is always going to want to get in the Word. But the happy person will, the believer will have a desire for the truth of God, the words of God, and delight in them. Go to Psalm 19 if you would quickly. Just a couple pages over. Psalm 19. There are many reasons the believer delights in the Word of God. Like I just said, this is His very Word. We love Him. We love His words. Psalm 19, after laying out the glory of God that's revealed in general creation, the skies, talks about the superiority of the written Word of God. Pick up in verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect. There are going to be some lines here that describe the Word of God and say what it does. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. You know, if you're a believer here this morning, it is the Word of God that has brought you salvation. Whether you heard it once and believed, or people have told you it thousands of times before you believe, it is the Word of truth that we came to understand and believe that brought us eternal salvation. Verse 7, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. How can we have wisdom in this world and know what's right and wrong and how to live and what not to do? The Word of God gives wisdom even to the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right. Rejoice in the heart. Now life is full of many difficulties, hardships, External and internal. Life's not easy. It's very painful. Sometimes, often very painful. But the Word of God reminds us that we have a God who's at work in all things. In the blessings and when He takes away. It rejoices the heart. Verse 8. The commandments of the Lord are pure, enlightening the eyes. Again, this is the book that we study to know truth. We can see beyond just the physical world and the unseen world, and God has revealed some of what He is doing. Go back to Psalm 1. The happy person delights in the Word of God, therefore, in verse 2, he meditates on it day and night. Meditates has the idea of to moan, to muse, to speak. Many times there's actually a verbal uh, noise involved in this word, but that's not absolutely required. The idea here is the word of God is not verbally spoken, it's, being, it's running through the mind. It's being spoken in the mind, so to speak. It's being digested, thought over, being meditated on. And this has been God's plan for believers of all ages. You know, Psalm 1 written probably by David in the Old Testament. This was God's plan for His children. Not just to have God's Word externally, 
but to have God's word within the heart and mind. You know, Joshua, think of Joshua chapter 1. You know, Joshua had a different job than I have. He was going to have to go in the land and do some dirty business. He's going to have to, he's a warrior. What's God tell Joshua though? Be strong and courageous. Do not let this book of, book of the law depart from your, your heart. Be careful to observe all that's written in it. You know, Christ and his temptations. What was one of his responses to the devil, the tempter? Man should not live by bread alone. And the uh, second half of that verse, according to the, what I call the popular evangelical version, is, but by a few select verses of God that strike you especially that day. Now what he says. Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Go to Colossians chapter 3 if you would. The Word of God is to not just be with us externally, but it's to find its way into our heart and lives. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Aaron years ago taught me that this is called the, the Musicians, John 3, 16. Colossians 3, 16. It starts out though, verse 16, But the Word of Christ richly dwell within you. It was to be true of the Old Testament saint in Israel, Psalm 1, is to be true of us today. God's word is to find its way into our heart and lives. It's not merely just a have to go to church, have to get my devotion, but I want the word of God to get in me, to be driving my life, to be controlling my thinking. It's called the musicians, John 3, 16, because the second half of the verse talks about some of the results of this. Wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another with songs, hymns, spiritual songs. But the point is the Word of God is to be within. Go back to Psalm chapter 1. And this is what the happy, the blessed person will do. Won't be letting the ideas of the world be driving a life. We'll have God's Word on the inside and it will be driving the life. You know, we're not, all to, we're not to be monks again. We're not to isolate ourselves from the world. Now, some people think it would be more holy if you move away and you know, don't deal with anyone. Maybe take a vow of silence and just supposedly study the Scripture. You know, one word of the monks got up to going through 137 or 138 psalms every single day. Now, maybe good, maybe bad. But if that's just a route, you know, just going through God's Word in a mechanical type way. That's not the idea here. <coughs> the Pharisees, many of the Pharisees in the New Testament, they knew God's Word very well. But they didn't believe it. They didn't submit to it and obey it. So it's not a mechanical, put God's Word in you. It's a delight in it. Chew it over in verse 2, back in Psalm 1. Meditates on it day and night. This is the continual driving force in life. And we all have different gifts and different responsibilities. But why do I get up every day and go to work? And hopefully work hard for the Lord. Just because? Or because God's Word, whether I have it memorized exactly, or I have it memorized exactly to do this, but it tells me to do it, so it drives me on. Why do I do, because why do, I do what I do? Because God's Word should be in me, driving my heart, my life. Meditates on you know, it's what I... You can read Psalm 119 on your own. That great, longest chapter in the whole Bible. A meditation on the Word of God. Psalm that says, I praise you seven times a day because of your Word. I can't wait for the night watches. They might meditate on your Word. Too often as a believer, it's easy to turn it into a mechanical checklist. Now, I'm all for discipline. So I believe we have warning desires, but it's more than just, I did it, I'm done with it, move on. I love it. I want it in me, so I can chew it over. And I'm a huge fan of memorization. Now, again, you can turn that into a mechanical process. The goal of med uh, memorization isn't just to, it will spit verses back out. The goal would be that so you can chew over God's truth. So you have the blessings that He says are involved in meditating on His Word day and night. I should say that this meditation is contrary to the world's idea of meditation. 
And sometimes meditation, meditation is a big, big deal in the world today, called by different names. One of the names of it is mindfulness. And different forms, variations of meditation. But most of them have to do with emptying the mind. Focus on a mantra or a flame or your belly button. Who wants to do that? We try to empty the mind. That's not the idea of biblical meditation. Biblical meditation is you're chewing God's word over. You're thinking it through. You're filling the mind. Not emptying the mind. The devil would like our minds to be empty, devoid of the word of God. God wants our minds to be filled up with, with his word and living obediently. I, what verse 1 and 2 is saying is that the word of God is at the center of a truly happy person's life. The blessed man is the one who delights in God's word day and night. Meditates on it day and night. You know, sometimes people tell me, well, I'm not very happy. Well, first, we got to ask, are you a believer? We read in Isaiah, there is no peace for the wicked, says the Lord. There will be a chasing this, chasing that, passing pleasure here and there, but there will be no peace. For those who haven't had their sins forgiven and come into a relationship with the living God. And then for the believer, what Psalm 1 is telling us is one of the things that needs to be at the core of the life to receive God's blessing, to live the happy life, if I can say it that way, is God's word as a sinner. Is, are you in God's word very much? Well, no, not really at all. Well, God says He supplies not only salvation, and glory in the future, but the resources for a joyful life, even in the difficulty now. But you have to take advantage of God's resources. You have to be in the Word. And more than that, you have to let God's Word be in you. Be dwelling at home in you. You know, we never grow beyond the Word. Someone told me a while back, I think it's been a little while now, but you know, at first, Bible study. And the scripture is important in the Christian life. But after a while, it's just about a close relationship with the Lord. That's a false dichotomy. You know, if you get saved, if you're a believer, you start a walk with the Lord, and it should start as a close walk. We never move beyond Him. We never grow beyond the Word of God. We grow in the Word of God. But we don't grow beyond it. He did an illustration in verse 3. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, its leaf does not wither. Whatever he does, he prospers. So a strong illustration of the blessed life, a tree planted by a stream of water. In Israel, a more arid, arid region than here. So we have, and we're kind of on the green line, that's a different issue. But over there, it's more arid. So you need a healthy tree, you need some, a water source, right? That's what's going to provide nourishment and cause the tree to be healthy. So the picture of the blessed man that's in God's word, delighting in it, like a tree planted by the stream of water. You know, just like that tree, its roots need to dig down into the water to find nutrients and be healthy. In a similar way, you know, our hearts and minds need to be digging, digging down in the word of God. So we can be healthy. It says in verse 3, which bears its fruit in its season, its leaf does not wither. The picture is a prosperous, healthy tree. As the believer is immersed in God's word, it is controlling the mind. We can bear fruit for the Lord. You know, Galatians 5 talks about that internal fruit, the love, the joy, the peace. Well, that's not automatic, so to speak. It's, it's through the Holy Spirit working, using the word of God in our lives. You know, first, 2 Timothy 3, talk about the Word of God is inspired, it's God-breathed, and it's profitable to equip us for every good work. And we want our lives to be bearing fruit for the Lord, right? I hope you do. I hope we do we want our lives to be fruitful and productive, to honor Him in every way. Our lives have to be planted in the Word of God like the tree planted by the stream of water. In the verse 3, in whatever He does, He prospers. Now, is this saying there will, no be, there will be no trials, heartache, difficulty in the believer's life? I don't think it's saying that. You know, the most godly man who ever lived, the God-man, our Lord, Jesus Christ, his life 
What's Isaiah say about him? A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He suffered and he died, so it's not like life is easy. It's not the health and wealth idea. You're in God's word and so I see a blessing and boy, you're going to get it returned 20 fold. That's not the idea. The idea though is I'll be able to do what the Lord wants me to. In whatever trial situation he brings in, and he brings in many, I can prosper, I can please him. At this point, I want to take a, a brief excursion. I believe it's pretty brief. Verse 1 through 3, you're talking about the blessed man. That's found in the Word of God. I'm going to take a brief and just look at a couple other scriptures that show us that being founded in the Word of God is a place of blessing, but it's also going to be a place of conflict and difficulty. And Psalm 1 doesn't stress this, but it does indicate it of sorts in verse 1. As we live a blessed life founded on God's Word, it's in the midst of those who don't submit to the Lord. A couple of the verses that developed this idea, though. What about Isaiah 66? Isaiah 66. First couple of verses talk about God's greatness. Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. Where then is the house you could build for me? Where is the place I may rest? For my hand made all these things. Thus all these things came to being, declares the Lord. He is the great creator God. He made all things by the word of His power. He sustains all things. Yet, verse 2, But to this one I will look. The idea is of look with favor. This man will have my favor, the creator. To him who is humble and contrite in spirit, who trembles at my word. God's favor is upon those who are humble, contrite in spirit, and who tremble before the Word of God. Don't ignore it. Don't deny it. Don't downplay it. Don't scoff at it. But tremble before it. This was what God had said. We do well to listen. Look at verse 5, though. Hear the Word of the Lord, you who tremble at His Word. You think if God's favor is upon you, maybe in the life is not going to be Smooth. Easy. Next line says, Your brothers who hate you, who exclude you for my name's sake. So while traveling in God's word will be the place of favor, it's also going to be the place of being excluded, being hated for the Lord's sake. You go to the New Testament. Go to Matthew chapter 5, if you would. The Sermon on the Mount begins with the Beatitudes. Matthew chapter 5. And the Beatitudes end, look at verse 10. Blessed are you when you're persecuted for the sake of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great. There's a blessing on those who submit to and tremble at and live according to God's word, but also in this world, it will bring opposition. And here Christ, in fact, says, rejoice when that happens. Now, if someone says something evil against me and it's my own fault, it's not a reason to rejoice. But if it's for me, standing for the Lord and His truth, living righteously, and others will, to one extent or another, be against those who love the Lord and His truth. When that happens, well, I can rejoice. Because my reward in heaven is great. Go to Matthew 13. Matthew 10 talks about similar things. But Matthew 13, the parable of the soils, the four soils, conditions of heart, how they respond to the word of God. Matthew 13, look at verse 20 and 21. Christ explains the second soil. One who received was sown on the rocky place. This is a man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Picture someone receives the message of the gospel. You can know the Lord has never since forgiven immediately. Oh boy, give me that. But verse 21. Yet he has no firm root in himself. It is only temporary. Why? Look what happens. 
when afflictions and persecutions arise because of the word, immediately he falls away. You know, afflictions and persecutions are not always of the same size and strength and kind, but they will arise to you as a believer, to me as a believer, because of the word. Standing on the truth of the word of God, gave him examples earlier, or in many other areas, you stand on the truth of the word of God. Christ is the only way to the Father. No one comes to the Father but through Him. That's exclusive. That's saying there's salvation, and it's as narrow as one man. Well, that's... Some might say, well, that's pretty narrow thinking, is it? Pretty bigoted thinking, is it? You know, people might say evil things. But you know what? The true believer stands and perseveres when those struggles and trials come. Let me just reference a couple other verses. Acts 14, after Paul prints some churches, he goes back through them to encourage them. He tells them in Acts 14, 22, through many tribulations, you must enter the kingdom of God. Paul tells Timothy, just before he's going to get his head cut off for representing the Lord, standing for his truth. Timothy, all those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Now, obviously, many of us are still alive here. Most of us haven't had our heads locked off. But in one form or another, not always physical acts, that still happens in the world today at any time, but people saying evil things, that will come because of the Word. My basic point, go back to Psalm 1. My basic point is the Word of God is a place of blessing. How blessed is the man. But it's also a place of difficulty. We cannot remain in God's blessing and not receive the difficulty that comes along with it. We can't move away from the Word of God to escape the pressure, the persecutions, the evil thing that men might say because of the Word without moving away also from the place of blessing. Because as we stand or committed to God's truth, we're going in opposition to the world. So Psalm 1 has with a blessed man, it doesn't develop it greatly in Psalm 1, but it will be a life of difficulty as well. Back to Psalm 1. If I can give you one other reference, you can write down Jeremiah 17. It gives a very similar illustration of verse 3 of the righteous man, the one who trusts in the Lord. Is a similar picture as verse 3. So verse 1 through 3, they know a description of the blessed person. Now verse 4 to 6, a strong contrast, a description of the wicked. Verse 4, the wicked are not so, but they are like chaff which the wind drives away. The wicked are not so. They're not blessed. They're not like the prosperous tree. But where are they like, verse 4? They're like chaff that the wind drives away. Now, I'm not a farmer, but they say chaff is the outside of the seed, the corn, or whatever. Yeah. What they would do, they'd, they'd harvest the wheat, the corn, the grain, whatever it was. They'd many times run a th uh, thresh threshing sledge over it, heavy object, and knock off the outer side. And what they do, so many times it'd be at the top of a hill, a more breezy area. They'd take a pitchfork, a winnowing fork, basically, basically a pitchfork. They'd toss the grain in the air. The corn, the valuable part, would fall down. The chaff, the outside garbage, really, lighter, and the wind would come and would blow it away. I mean, we had a windy day. That's really windy out there. I don't know. The last night, this morning, it was windy. You think about going outside, picking up some leaves, rubbing them together in the dust, and out in the wind, just and they blow it away. That's the picture, basically. The wicked are like chaff, which the wind drives away. The chaff is the, the garbage. That one doesn't remain. It's not valuable. A strong illustration of the wicked. And we many times don't like how strong God is in His language. He compares the wicked, those who do not know the Lord in verse 4, to chaff. That one doesn't have any value. It's blown away. And we like to think, Maybe God loved us because how valuable we are in ourselves. That's not the picture of the Scripture. The picture of the Scripture is we're like chaff. 
Now Isaiah 64, 6 says, All our righteous deeds are like filthy garments in His sight. On our own, apart from His work in the life, we're not of great value to the Lord. We're fit for burning. And look, you think this is, you know, sometimes people say, well, that's the God of the Old Testament. My God of the New Testament is different. No, He's not. When John introduced our Messiah, Jesus Christ, in Matthew chapter 3, verse 12, he says, His willing fork is in His hand. He will thoroughly clear the threshing floor. He will gather the wheat in the barns. He will burn the chaff with unquenchable fire. Many times the chaff will be swept up and burnt. Same God, both Testaments. See, I have a stronger illustration between the righteous, the healthy tree, and the chaff. Verse 5 and 6 explain the picture. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, or sinners in the assembly of the righteous. What's the picture of a chaff being blown away? What's the reality behind that? The reality is judgment. The wicked will not stand in the judgment, or sinners in the assembly of the righteous. Psalm 1 doesn't lay out the different judgments that the New Testament lays out. It just states the fact of judgment. There is judgment. The wicked will not stand in the judgment. Sinners in the assembly of the righteous. Now from New Testament Revelation we know the ultimate judgment of the unbeliever will be at the great white throne. Revelation 20 describes that. A horrible, <coughs> terrifying picture of judgment. And then Revelation 21 and 22 have the new heavens and the new earth in which only righteousness will go to if you would go to Revelation chapter 21. Again, Psalm 1 doesn't develop this, it just states the fact that in the end, when judgment comes, no wicked will remain. Revelation chapter 21, verse 27. In the context of a description of the new Jerusalem and the new earth, verse 27 of Revelation 21, and nothing unclean, and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it. But only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. In the end, when God is done, so to speak, when He brings final judgment, there will be no more unredeemed men on the earth. Psalm 1 is basically a prophecy in nugget form almost. Go back to Psalm 1. The wicked will not stand in the judgment. Sinners will not remain in the assembly of the righteous. You know, the Bible is always pulling our attention forward. Like a spyglass, so to speak. Always bringing our attention to the future. And what God will do in the future. And live in light of what God will do. Well, in the end, the right, the wicked, they will not remain. They'll be, like, they'll be blown away. Verse 6 of Psalm 1. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. You know, a comforting fact for the believer. The Lord knows the way of the righteous. You know, how great is our God? Controlling all the universes, all the world. And He personally is acquainted with all of our ways, each of us individually. No sinners will make it through the judgment. You know, no riding someone's coattails, no sneaking in with a crowd. But also God will not accidentally bring judgment to any of his saints either. The Lord knows the way of the righteous. As a comfort for the believer, also should be a terror for the unbeliever. He knows us as we are. He knows all we've done, all we think, all we are. The way of the wicked will perish though. And the psalm starts, if I can say this one, a very uh, positive note. How blessed. It ends... Not on a negative note, I don't want to say it that way, but it ends on a, a somber note. The wicked are like chaff, and they will not remain through the judgment. Because the psalm contrasts two types of people. The trees and the chaff, the righteous and the wicked. The doomed will not remain through the judgment, and the blessed, we even blessed now. So a very simple, I guess, a question for every one of us personally is, which group are you in? Are you a tree or are you chaff? Will you remain through the judgment or will you be blown away and burnt? 
Now, amazing thing is, and Psalm 1 doesn't develop this fact, but the amazing thing is that God has provided a way for the chaff, those who are fit for burning, to be transformed, to be made trees, if I can stick with the illustration. Go to Psalm 32 for a second. Psalm 32. Psalm 32, verse 1 and 2. How blessed is, how blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. Now we are all sinners. We have all, Romans 3 says, fallen short of the glory of God. We are all guilty. We all begin as chaff, fit for judgment. But God has provided a way for forgiveness of sins. The New Testament lays this out so clearly. Christ, God became a man in Christ Jesus, fully God and fully man. We sang about it in some of the songs this morning. He died for us. Hallelujah for the cross. And in His death, He was paying the penalty for my sin, for your sin, for all men's sins. Now, Many verses in the scripture say, you trust in him. Not, you know, how's a piece of chaff, I've like used a picture, transform itself into a tree that's going to remain? It doesn't. But God has provided a way for sinners like you and me to have our sins forgiven. Not to try to work our way to heaven, but to have our iniquity wiped away. Cleansed whiter than snow. But a person must recognize, I am who God says I am. I am the chaff. I am a sinner. I see what God has done in Christ. Though. He took my place on that cross. I'm not going to trust in myself, my church attendance, my good works, my Bible reading, anything else. I'm going to turn and trust in Jesus Christ, His work for me. God promises. The God who cannot lie promises. Anyone who trusts in Christ, their sins will be wiped away. That's a starting point of blessing. How blessed is the man whose transgression is forgiven. That's the starting point. There is a way for the chaff. That's how amazing our Lord is. Those fit for burning, who provided a way through our Savior to be forgiven, made new. And the message of Psalm 1 for the believer, the message for the unbeliever is, if there's any way of escape from the judgment, find that way. And the New Testament lays out, the Bible lays out that way. God doesn't desire, He will burn the chaff. But He doesn't desire that any will perish. Why will you die? He provided a Savior. I'm not the Savior, but He is the Savior. Trust in Him, you can be forgiven. The message of Psalm 1 for the believer, it's quite simple. It's a review for many of you. I'm re re stirring up your mind as you know these things, many of you already. The message of Psalm 1 for us is, don't be tempted to go the way of the world. As Romans quote puts it, don't be conformed to this world. Don't listen to the advice, the counsel, the important things of the wicked, those who don't listen to God. Don't, don't observe the way and say, no, I want to go after them. That way looks better. That's the way of burning. Don't join in with those, but delight in God's word. Meditate on it day and night. We never get away from the truth of the word of God. Been a believer five minutes, 50 years. We never get away from the truth of God's word. How great our Savior is. He provides forgiveness of glory to come. Read about in Revelation again. And also in this life, He provides the provisions for the blessed life. Again, not the easy life. It will meet many trials that the Lord, our sovereign God, puts in our lives. Our lives will be in conflict with the world, going the opposite way, and that will be more difficulty. But also He provides joy, blessedness in this life. We have to take advantage of His Word, though, His blessings. Can't close our ears to His truth. So let's love it more, cling to it more, delight in it, meditate on it day and night. Let's pray. Lord, thank You for Your Word. Or this psalm so familiar. <coughs> Lord, but it is true. There is coming a day when you bring the final judgment. 
And no men or women or children who ever have their sins forgiven through Christ will remain. Lord, thank you that you know the way of the righteous. You will make no mistakes in judgment. You are the perfect God, the all-wise, omnipotent one, omniscient one. But to somber thought, Lord, thank you to those who belong to you, though. Thank you for the forgiveness of sins, for the provision in this life. Lord, may we not be deceived by the thinking, the philosophies, the teaching of the world. We turn our ears away, whatever we need to turn away from. We turn to your truth, receive your blessing, your provision, your joy as we walk with you in this life. Lord, you are a great God, you are a gracious God. We thank you for your provisions. May you change us, may you encourage us, may you challenge us through your word. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks for your attention.